as I just pray. Oh, loving Father, what an amazing thing it is to know you, to have salvation in Jesus, to recognize that we have hope. And it's a hope beyond this world. It's a hope and an eternity with you. Yes, a little while in the heavens, but Lord, we're going to come back here and we're going to see this earth made new. We're going to see what it should have been, what it could have been. And so, Lord, we want to prepare for that just now. So, Father, we've worshipped you in song, in story, in prayer. And now, Lord, we want to worship you in your word. So, Lord, I need your help. Without you, Father, I have nothing of any value to share. So, Lord, I just ask that you might please speak through me. Forgive me where I have failed. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. But, Lord, I'm not going to be selfish. I'm also praying for my brothers and sisters. They don't know who this preacher from Charlotte is. So, Lord, I pray that you would give them a blessing today, not because of me, but because Jesus comes shining through. Lord, take away our distractions. It's easy for that phone to vibrate or buzz or somebody says something and we're lost track. Keep us laser focused, Lord, on your word as we spend these moments together. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to take you back to the fall of 2007, the fall of what year? 2007. I want to make sure you're, you're paying attention here. I had recently returned from the desert. Pastor Dex mentioned I served in the army, spent 12 months in Iraq with the army, and if I never see another desert, it's too soon. <laughs> People can say all they want, Pastor, that, oh, desert, desert's not that bad, it's a dry heat. <laughs> Listen, so's my oven. <laughs> right? I don't want to put my head in my oven either, that's a dry heat too. I was so thankful to come back to the lush greenery of North Carolina but here we are, we're, we're in Hickory, North Carolina. My family had lived there, we had been at Southern. I actually enlisted in the Army while I was at Southern because I was thinking maybe God was leading me to military chaplaincy. I enlisted as a chaplain assistant, ended up doing 12-month deployment. We come back, and we've got about six months to get life ready again to return to Southern. So we're out, we're working at this, in the yard of this little rental home. Ginger and I have been blessed with three children. We have two boys with a girl in the middle, and I praise God, I only have three. Can anybody say amen? <laughs> and one of my new favorite phrases is adult children, right? I, I'm loving that part of my life, you know, they're adults now. But at this point, they weren't adults. And we're working in the yard, doing a few things. The kids are running around, and the sun starts to peek over the hill. It's time to get supper, it's time to get baths, and it's time to get ready for bed. Well, as Ginger and I are bringing things to a close, we look around, one kid, two kids, one kid, two kids, where's number three? Our youngest, his name is Carson. We begin to call out like any good country folk, <laughs> right? Carson! Carson! No response. I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised in such a way that if your mom and dad hollers for you, oh, yeah. they better hear something, right? Or you're going to hear something. You understand? You understand? I'm a little old school, right? So again, Carson, no response. It's a fairly small yard, right? We're, we're living kind of on the, the suburbs there of Hickory, a little place called Longview. It was not a huge yard. But there's a little building, so we checked the building. We're looking around the yard. We had a trampoline. He wasn't under the trampoline. There was a little carport. We didn't see him in the carport. Ginger made her way into the house, did not see him in the house. And you know that feeling when you go from irritation to annoyance to concern. Because what's the natural thought? If I've made 10 laps around this little yard, she's been in the house, and we're calling for him, and there's no response, where does your mind naturally jump? Abduction. Some creep just took my kid. Now listen, when your kids are small, you will do anything in the world and you don't want to see them taken. When they become teenagers, you pray somebody will take them. <laughs> I'm, teenagers, I'm sorry, I love you. But I'm going to tell you, teenagers can be challenging. And it's hard for them, isn't it? Their bodies are changing. They're trying to figure out what life is all about. They're trying to know how to make friends. It's hard being a teenager. Can you say amen? But they wasn't a teenager. 
And so my heart is sick. I can see the worry, the grow growing on Ginger's face. We're still calling out at this point fruitlessly, right? Foolishly almost because he's not responded. What's going to change? And so I asked Ginger, are you sure you checked in the house? Oh, yes, I've been through the house. And I said, well, let me look. And so again, just thinking the worst, that sick feeling growing in my stomach, cold sweat starting to form on my body at the thought of my child being gone calling out still, Carson. And listen, I know, how to be, I know how to get loud. And I go in there, and I look down under the bed, and I see the tip of a toe underneath the edge of his bed, and I snatched that boy out from underneath that bed with a movement that brought him back to reality. And he was smiling. He was lying under there, Dex, the whole time, and he heard us. And he's just laying under there grinning. <laughs> they can't find me. <laughs> oh, they're looking. I hear us. And I asked him, did you not hear us? Yeah, I heard you. <laughs> and fortunately for him, he had been missing in our minds long enough that I was happier to hold him than scold him. Amen. Amen. But you can imagine, and I promise you, I made it abundantly clear to him that next time I holler for you, I better hear from you instantly. Please don't scare us that way. He thought we were just playing hide and seek. And saints, when I think about that story, did you realize that the game of hide and seek, kids, did you realize the game of hide and seek was created in the Bible? Did you know that? You say, well, pastor, you're crazy. Well, that's another topic, but bear me out. We'll debate that later, right? The only one that knows for a fact I'm crazy might be Jeremy Hess, because in my very first pastoral district, his mom and dad were two of our members. So what a nice thing to make a connection and get to see you today, Jeremy. But open your Bibles with me, please. Let's investigate this claim that this game of hide-and-seek was created in the Bible. Open your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis what? Genesis chapter 3. And just land on verse 1. We're going to dive into a few things. But as we're beginning to think about this, I want you to imagine the setting. I don't know how many of you like to visit botanical gardens or... Or, or all of those kinds of things, see beautiful plants. I love to look at beautiful plants. I do not have the ability to keep beautiful plants alive, right? Some people have green thumbs. I'm pretty sure I have a black one, <laughs> right? I'm going to kill anything that I touch. I don't bring that life. I don't have that green thumb, okay? But here in this garden, everything's perfect. Imagine a place where there's no sickness. Imagine you've never heard the word cancer. Imagine... We're coming into the fall season. And on the drive over from Charlotte this morning, Ginger made the comment, oh, I'm seeing the trees start to change. Imagine you've never seen a leaf change. Imagine you've never seen a leaf die and fall from a tree. You have zero context to understand death. Now, I didn't keep count, but I think I heard you describe at least four funerals and or memorial services that have touched this faith community in short order. My boss, the director for ministerial, Elder Haskell Williams, lost his wife three weeks ago, almost four weeks ago now. Unexpectedly, they went down to South Carolina. He actually preached a funeral. On a Friday, they came back to Columbia, South Carolina. She started feeling a little poorly. Sabbath morning, she said, please get me to a hospital. I think I'm dying. Before he could get dressed, Boom, she hit the floor. By Sunday morning, she was gone. You and I understand death. Yeah. Adam and Eve, they had no context. They had been told, right? Remember back in chapter 2? Of every tree of the garden, you may freely what? Eat. Freely eat, but of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat, lest you surely die. It was theoretical. Right? It would be kind of like me walking a tightrope. 
It's completely theoretical. There's a tightrope. Dude walks on it. But do you ever notice it's never big people? <laughs> you ever notice it's always those skinny folk, right? They, they, they never get a fat man up on that wire. It's not happening. I don't understand it. Adam and Eve, to be told, yes, you will surely die, conceptually, they didn't get it. Yes, they believed God, or did they? Because it's one thing, and you and I do this all the time, right? Oh, yeah, I accept that. I believe that. I've cleared, uh, Pastor, a number of people for baptism over the course of ministry. And every one of them that I've agreed to baptize, they've agreed to live by the tenets and say, yes, I believe what the church believes. I believe what the Bible teaches. The fruit will be borne out whether you believe what you profess. Amen? Amen. Same happened for Adam and Eve. Now we come to chapter 3. Are you in Genesis 3 with me? Say amen if you're there. If you need more time, say have mercy. Mercy. I'll wait on you. I get paid by the month, brother. (laughs) Now the serpent, verse 1, are you there? This is New King James Version. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. And he said to the woman... Now pause. Here you are, Eve, making your way around the botanical paradise. You had seen most many, probably all of God's creation. At this point, how many animals had she heard speak? None. How many of you have ever come home and your dog didn't greet you with a bark? It said, hey, good evening. We look at that and we say, well, that's crazy. Well, let's give Eve just a little bit of credit. Was what happened pretty fantastic? Yeah, here she comes along and it's this snake. She had seen a snake before. She didn't have the inherent fear that many of us have with snakes. And it's not so much for me that I fear snakes, I just don't like them. Right? And I feel bound, I feel commissioned, I feel called to bring about their death when I meet snakes. Yeah, I mean, this weird thing's happened, Pastor. I get near a snake, its head falls off. I can't really explain it. I don't like them. But Eve, not a problem, but it starts talking. What? What's happening? Of course she's going to listen. We're a little hard on Eve sometimes, but I guarantee you, you would have listened to. Hearing a snake talk. If you came home and your dog started talking to you, you would sit and listen. In fact, I know what you would do. You'd have it on Instagram so fast it'd make somebody's head swim. And then everybody would call you a liar and say that you faked it. Right? But you would be there, talk to me, Rex. Talk to me, Coco. Well, I was lying around today, and I really don't like the milk bones that you've been buying. You've been doing that for 15 years. They're a little old. Can we try something else? Think about how you would have reacted. Notice, he speaks. We're still in chapter 3, Genesis verse 1. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice now, he starts talking about the things of God. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat. Now she, she, she adds a little to it. We sometimes do that, don't we? If we don't think God has been specific enough, we'll add to it. And if we think he's been too specific, we like to take away from it. And just so you know, that's called conservative and liberal Christianity. That's what I've seen. When somebody calls themselves super conservative, many times God, what God gave you wasn't enough, you have to add to it. And liberalism, many times, is what God gave me was too much, let me just take it in the spirit. How about what God said was enough, and you don't need to change it one way or the other? Don't take a play from Eve's playbook, saints. She added a little something, okay, lest you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said, what? You will not, what's the word? What's the adverbial modifier that's there? You will not surely die, right? And we know what that really means. It's like, ah, come on. Essentially, the serpent was saying, "Ah, come on. Aren't you taking that a little too far? Oh, you won't surely die. In other words, you won't really die. I remember I had a friend of mine, let me use the air quotes, had a friend of mine, 
we were at my grandfather's in western North Carolina. I grew up just a couple hours from here. Anybody heard of Alexander County? Almost nobody. <laughs> Get out to city a little bit, folks. Tour of the beautiful state of North Carolina. Grew up over in Alexander County. My grandfather ran a junkyard. And he kept cows in the junkyard so that it would keep the grass seat down between the vehicles so that when people came to buy junk parts, used parts, they didn't have to walk through snaky grass. So this electric fence, and I had this little toy police car. I was with my friend, and he said, I wonder what would happen if you put that car on the fence. Well, of course, I was brilliant. I said, I don't know. I didn't understand conductivity. I learned a lesson. Because when I took that car, and I, was, I, was, I, was, I wasn't real quick to accept it. I was like, I don't know. And he's like, oh, nothing will happen. Well, I found out that something will happen. It wasn't aluminum. right? It was ferrous. It was metal. It had iron in it. And it went from that electric fence through me. And I got a little Pentecostal for a moment. <laughs> Just for a moment until I found myself sitting on my, my backside. My friend lied to me. Did the devil lie to Eve? You won't surely die. Oh, come on. And guess what? She took the fruit. She ate it. Did she fall over dead in that instant? Yes or no? Oh, does it look like, in the immediate aftermath, does it look like the devil was telling the truth? Hmm. And can you imagine? Don't you know that that, and people say the apple, we don't know what it was. But can you imagine? Somebody said mango. <laughs> I don't like papaya, so I imagine that it was papaya. For some reason to me, papaya smells like vomit. And, and I don't, I don't, if you like it, God bless you, if you can eat that. God gave me a lot more other things to eat. But anyway, can you imagine? It was probably delicious. It probably just, oh, felt so satisfying. And then the fact that she didn't die instantly, as she had imagined, it seemed to embolden the story. A am I right? Oh, yeah. and, and I know that it emboldened the story because it says that she gave it to Adam. And people get into this big debate about whether Adam was right by her side or whether he was just in the garden. My man Chris is in the sound booth. Is he with me on the stage? But if I said, Chris and I were at church today, is that an accurate statement? Yes. Doesn't have to be standing right beside me. Tell me this. If Adam had been there, why did he keep his mouth shut? Gentlemen, are you going to sit there and keep your mouth shut if your wife's about to do something eternally foolish? Well... <laughs> Randy, I'm going to pray for you. He, he, Randy, my friend, right? Yeah, it won't bother you. <laughs> Randy, want me to get Pentecostal. So I believe that he was in the garden. When it says her husband who was with her, I simply mean that it, think that it meant in the context of being in the garden. They were together in the garden. He would have had some part in the story had he heard the dialogue. Okay, let's just use common sense. But the point is... Not whether he was right beside her or proximate. The larger point is, is that that brother, knowing better, took that fruit and he ate it. Yes or no? Yes. Continue the story with me from the scripture. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes... And a tree desirable to make one wise, right? Because that was the other part of the sales pitch. The only reason God's keeping this from you is because he knows when you eat it, you get to be like him and he's just being selfish. He doesn't want you to be like him. That was the story. That was the lie. And so she said in her mind, man, this is pleasant. It's desirable to make me like God. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. The eyes of them both were open, verse 7, Genesis 3, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, 
Another part of living in this paradise was not just being where there was no sickness, there was no death, but every evening, or at least on a regular basis, they had an evening stroll with God. And I don't know how you finish your day off, but I would love to finish my day off with Jesus in person. Can you imagine? Walking, talking. Jesus, what did you guys do today? What'd you discover? Jesus, you, you won't believe what we saw today. We saw this plant and describing its beauty to the creator. How's that for? But you know that's what you would do, right? How many times do your kids do that when they experience something amazing? You saw it yourself. You know you were there before, but that kid has so much fun telling you all about it. Amen? And that's what they would have done. But now Jesus shows up for the evening get together and notice what happens. The Lord God, verse 9, Genesis 3, he called to Adam and said to him, where what? Where are you? Why is he doing that? Back up to verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, right? It's in the evening. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And children, that is the moment that the game hide and seek was invented. Do you see it for yourself, saints? Was somebody hiding, yes or no? Was somebody seeking? The game hide and seek was invented right there. And Adam and Eve, like Carson, heard God calling and kept their mouths shut at first. Oh, we heard you coming. And we went and hid ourselves because we were naked. Who told you that you were naked? Now, friends, let me ask you a question. Was God asking these questions because he lacked understanding? No, 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 no. Don't get it wrong. You cannot inform God of anything. But let me give you a principle that I hope you can apply here as well. Pause Genesis 3 for just a second. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is teaching on prayer. He starts in verse 5. We're used to picking up about verse 8 with the Lord's prayer, right? But in verse 8, he says, Your Father in heaven knows what you have need of before you even ask. And people over the years, pastor, have asked me, well, if God already knows, why am I praying? Listen, prayer is not about informing God. It's about bringing you in harmony with the will of God. Amen. Amen. I love what we're told in Steps to Christ that prayer is not about bringing God down to us. It's about bringing us up to God. I don't know about you, but as much as I love Carolina... And I know the song, nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina. Somebody should have said, hey man, I'm in the wrong state. You don't know the song? Listen, what time's sundown? You need to put that on your Google list, your YouTube list. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina. Yeah, I get it. In the morning, I'm going to stop singing. They hid themselves. They heard God calling. They revealed that they were naked. They weren't informing God. He was asking that they might express the understanding for themselves of what had happened. And I won't take time to unpack for you the fallout of that sin, except to say this. There was a death that day. It wasn't a physical death, but it was a spiritual death. Am I right? Prior to that moment, when they said that we hid ourselves, we clothed ourselves with fig leaves because we realized that we were naked, with what were they covered prior to that? The robe of Christ's righteousness. When that robe was taken away, was that a moment of spiritual death, yes or no? Yes, because for the first time in their existence, they did not stand in the righteousness of God, they stood in the filthy rags of their own righteousness, as Isaiah 64 tells us. And when you and I stand in that, we are naked before the universe. No garment can hide that nakedness and shame. God sees right through it. And so I submit to you that, yes, there was a death that day. So, well, Pastor, what does this have to do with Chapel Hill today? What does this have to do with New Life Fellowship? Let me bring it full circle and then we'll, we'll land the ship or land the, land the plane. I am so thankful 
And I'm so very proud of you as a church family that you want to increase your footprint and what you can do as a church family here on this property. That's a positive thing, yes or no? It's a positive thing, but what I find, and, and here's where I'm going to challenge you just a little bit, okay? Is, is it okay if I challenge you? Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. <laughs> I, want to get, I want to get this on record because I'm going to do it without permission, but I'd rather have permission, amen? <laughs> I find that historically churches expand for one of two reasons, primary reasons. There might be other things, but there's one of two primary reasons. Number one, we're uncomfortable. And we want more room to be comfortable. Do you know that statistically, when a church reaches 80% capacity, it stops growing? 80% in a U.S. context. Why? Can I step down to you, Pastor? Here's why. Okay? Now pretend I'm on in Spirit Airlines and I'm flying in oh, coach. God, Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> we like personal space. In the U.S., right? In, in many countries, especially a European context, you can sit at a table that might be a four-top table, and you sit down by yourself, and other people will come sit with you. That doesn't happen in the States. You're sitting at a four-person table by yourself, and somebody sits down, you're going to look at them and say, excuse me? Do I know you? Can you imagine? I want you to try that this week. Just try that. Go sit down at a table with somebody that thinks they're sitting by their self. And, do I know you? No. And just start eating. See what the Lord can do for you. Don't call me if you get in trouble. Keep your pastors. No Here's my point, saints. Churches grow and then they sometimes they, they want to build to have more room to be comfortable. Other churches, they look around and they say, you know what? We need to be able to more effectively reach our community because we live in a place where a lot of people are spiritually dead yeah. and they're playing hide and seek with God. Yeah. All right, bring it on. And we want to go out and find them. Amen. What is your purpose? Don't, don't raise your hands. I didn't call Pastor Dex and say, hey, did I ask you why you guys were expanding? No. That's why I don't know. I don't know. You may be completely on track for the reasons you're doing it. But if you haven't been, here's a wake-up call. Here's a challenge. Do it for the right reasons. Because if, if, if all you're doing is making yourselves more comfortable, you're on a path to spiritual death. But if you're trying to position yourselves to reach the community, then reach the community. Don't be satisfied with what you have. And I'm not talking about that discontent that draws me to want greater materialism. I'm talking about that discontent that we haven't reached more souls with the good news of the gospel. Amen. The first angel carries it in his arms and the Bible describes it as the everlasting gospel. Amen. How many are in the greater Chapel Hill, Durham, RTP area that need Jesus? Amen. How many have outright rejected him because of secular reasoning. And they say, well, anybody with it, it's real logical wouldn't follow that. I'm going to tell you, what brought me to Jesus was the logical flow and understanding of biblical truth. Amen. I couldn't argue with it. Amen. It just made sense to me. And I knew I was a sinner. And I knew I eventually figured out I was playing hide and seek with God. And here he was chasing me. He was calling, Daryl, Daryl. I've got something better for you. Come out from under the bed. Come into my arms. Let me save you from yourself. And folks, I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're going through the motions. Maybe you've been playing hide and seek a little bit. Because it's real easy to fall into going through the motions. You and I know how to come to church and we know how to throw a happy Sabbath on somebody. Right, and we know how to grin. Happy Sabbath, how you doing? I'm doing great. Praise God, hallelujah. But inside we're hurting. Let's be authentic. Let's be genuine. You know what I've started saying when people ask me, hey, how are you? I have a go-to phrase, you ready? You can steal it if you want it. I just tell people I'm living the dream. <laughs> Keep in mind there are two kinds of dreams. 
And right now it might not be any of your business which dream I'm living. But you know another phrase I like to use is I'd like to just tell people, you know, I'm blessed. Because despite my trials, I'm still blessed, am I not? So today, saints, I ask you in closing, have you been hiding? Or have you stepped back out into the light and asked Jesus to reclothe you with his righteousness? I want to step into the light and I want to ask my Jesus to clothe me with his righteousness. How about you? May God bless you and keep you. Thank you.